welcome to today's Energy Central webcast entitled, The Utility Perspective, Navigating the Evolving Regulatory Landscape. I'm happy to turn the floor over to our first speaker, Jim Shields with Black and Beach to kick things off. Jim, welcome to the event. You have the floor. Thanks, and uh, just want to thank everybody for joining today. Um, pretty interesting topic. Uh, it's of note, you know, um, in the in our industry anyways, around how we go about justifying investment plans. But um, happy to be joined today with um, some folks we've worked with and folks who we've got to know over the last couple of years. And um, just wanted to introduce those folks. Um, I'll introduce myself and I'll turn it over to them to, to introduce themselves. Um, Jim Shields, Black and Beach, uh, spent most of my time working for electric utilities in the Midwest. Uh, working my way through engineering and um, got into leadership in the last last decade or so spent a lot of time with asset management investment planning and uh, taking those plans and, and working them through uh, the regulatory process. but uh, glad to be here glad to be with black and beach and uh, working with this great panel andrew i'll turn it over to you thanks jim uh andrew wells i'm an associate general counsel with duke energy and i've been working in the uh utility regulatory space for about 10 years and have had the opportunity to work with uh, uh, Black and & Beach uh, and Jim on a few filings in the Midwest and I'm excited to uh, be here today. Thank you. Jason? Hi, yeah, my name is Jason Jones and I work for the Public Service Company in New Mexico as their Director of Generation Engineering. I've been in uh, working with or working for a utility for the past uh, 23 years, and I'm happy to share my experience and perspective on this panel. Thanks, Jason. David. Hey, Shin. Um, hi, everyone. Um, I'm the practice pipeline uh, pipeline practice lead for Copper Leaf, and I've uh, been working with uh, uh, utilities and um, primarily gas uh, transmission and distribution utilities in the United States for the last three, four years. And prior to that, spent about uh, a decade in the upstream energy industry as well. So happy to be here today. Thanks. So we wanted to start out um, just talking about real briefly here this partnership that Black and Beach and Copperleaf have. And I think it's a really interesting uh, partnership because we complement each other. So from a Black and Beach perspective, um, you know, we're a company that's over 100 years old. Um, we have utility industry solution expertise all the way from, you know, grid mod on the distribution side and then up through the generation, um, both in electric and gas, uh, water as well. Um, but we have a strong practice in asset risk, asset management um, that, that we bring to the table that complements the, the copper leaf tool. Uh, also, investment value identification. Um, you know, this is um, being able to ring out benefits um, from these investments. And then we also provide a regulatory filing support uh, function as well. And I think that complements um, Copperleaf in the sense that they're the software solution, right? They, they have the, the engine behind uh, being able to take all these diverse investments and um, being able to do a cost benefit analysis on it. But it, the beauty of it is it's an enterprise software platform. And it, it drives down to value-based decision-making. Uh, they're able to quantify values for value. And we'll talk about that here in a bit. And then um, really the another strength of the copper leaf tool is this um, optimization functionality. Got this whole host of investments. Um, how do we optimize that? What are the constraints around it? And, and how is that built? And David will speak to that a little bit later in the presentation. But um, Wanted to note the, the complementary um, effect of this partnership. So wanted to run through just a couple of trending regulatory and utility objectives. Um, you're probably familiar with all of these, uh, but just wanted to get the, the trendy ones out in front of everybody. Uh, decarbonization, um, everybody's talking about it. A lot of folks move in that direction. Um, you know, the challenge here in investment planning is uh, what's that mean, actually? Um, if we take uh, carbon-based uh, energy sources off the system, where do we put them back on the system? And what kind of investments need to take place on the distribution system, the transmission system, and how do you determine where that goes? So um, just trying to frame that up a little bit. Modernization is, uh, it ties into all this, right? We we historically run an, uh, a system that is has some age to it. Um, and then, you know, we've got aging infrastructure with us all the time. So when we upgrade, old equipment to new equipment, um, we can we can modernize in that fashion. And then modernization also means if we're going to 
have all kinds of different distributed injury resources around our system, do we have the systems and the processes and, and can that system uh, handle that? So a pretty broad uh, definition there. Resiliency. Um, we view resiliency as just one component of reliability. Um, you know, reliability is, you know, how often and how long do outages occur on electric systems? And resilience is, is this function around how fast can you restore outages on systems? Um, so just wanted to clarify that from our view. Um, environmental and social governance. Um, you know, what we're trying to do here is demonstrate values being generated for all stakeholders. David's going to touch on this a little bit later on how uh, we can model this and how we can demonstrate that ESG principles are being applied to investment planning. And then lastly, uh, prosumers. Um, this is where actually customers are generating electricity. Um, and then what does that mean on our system? Um, what reinforcements need to take place? What controls and what um, regulation is around that? So just want to touch on some trending one, some trending op uh, objectives here. Um, I'd like to throw a couple of questions over to Andrew and Jason. Um, first of all, Andrew, um, when you look across your uh, your jurisdictions, can you talk briefly about um, you know which one of these are being emphasized more than the other, and and how do you guys adjust to that when it comes to investment planning? Yeah, thank you, Jim. Uh, uh, as you all are probably aware on uh, that are attending the webinar today. You know, Duke Energy has a pretty wide uh, service territory from the Midwest to Florida to the Carolinas, and specifically in the Midwest and in Indiana, the fo the regulatory focus has been primarily on that resiliency piece that Jim mentioned, uh, with consideration to uh, you know, decar decarbonization, modernization, uh, more as a secondary. Uh, uh, factors, you know, the resiliency and the reliability of the grid being um, the driver with acknowledgement these the other items are occurring at the same time. So, you know, we we put an emphasis on that and uh, tried to quantify those benefits and put those uh, priorities at the forefront. Uh, but that's not the same. I mean, the, juris the geographic uh, different diversity in our uh, enterprise-wide uh, organization uh, causes some of these other uh, components to to have more priority than they would in other locations. So, uh, you know, we've been uh, able to uh, try to, you know, quantify those uh, priorities as the, is appropriate in the, depending on what jurisdiction we're, we're operating in or presenting a uh, portfolio to that commission. And Jason, when, when you consider your area, um, any emphasis here? Yeah, so a, a few years ago, our legislature actually passed the Energy Transition Act, which, which gives us timelines for decarbonization, uh, and that deadline being 2045. Um, and then our company actually um, improved on that deadline and, and made the decarbonization a priority for 2040. And all of this while keeping the system resilient. And then we have a very large um, behind the meter presence. About 10% of our load is active, peak load is generated behind the meter. And so balancing the uh, decarbonization with what the prosumers are doing uh, while keeping the grid resilient is all very much a, a priority for us. Uh, that being said, the other two uh, bubbles are also occurring um, with ESG and modernization, uh, but definitely the decarbonization and, and the prosumer are, are, are top of our minds right now. Yeah, and I think you know what we want to emphasize here is, is that um, with these objectives, and there's more than these, obviously, um, you know, we need to start thinking in terms of tools and processes that allow us to capture um, all the benefits and programs um, where investments could be made and then be able to demonstrate um, to all stakeholders um, how we derive those benefits. Um, so one thing we wanted to maybe touch on here is the complexity of that, right? 
if we look about um, how business was done historically, relatively few objectives, um, which generated a, you know, a little larger amount of solutions, and I've, I don't have them all listed here. I've kind of simplified this. And then the analysis process associated with that. But if we think about the new world we live in, um, you know, there's there's more objectives. Um, we've touched on a few, but we've listed a couple here. Um, and another thing that's um, relatively new is the pre-approval of investments, right? You, um, you've got to uh, put a case together and, and then demonstrate that the investments are worth uh, investing in. But what that means is there's several different more solutions to that, which uh, expands the complication of how you go about analyzing that. And if we just look at clean energy for a minute here, right? Um, that's an objective, but the solutions could be energy storage, um, renewables. Um, I'll throw in here, there's benefits uh, associated with clean energy around volt bar optimization for demand reduction, conservation, energy reduction. And I'll even throw in here that um, clean energy can derive benefits from installing self-healing networks in the sense that the more distributed energy we have on the distribution system, um, you got to have access to the distribution system to um, allow that energy to get up on the grid. And so self-healing teams add benefit to accessibility to DERs, um, along with all those historical benefits of reducing CMI and such. So the point here is this, is that um, as the number of solutions increase, and underneath each one of these solutions are candidate projects to be considered, um, the tool and being able to build all of these um, benefit factors has to be um, able to take all of those into consideration, do cost benefit analysis, be able to optimize on um, what the objectives are from those programs, and then derive a benefit cost analysis that justifies the investment. And I think that's where um, you know this notion about bringing expertise in from the industry and, and leveraging a software tool like Copperleaf. Um, really enables that to take place. So um, maybe Andrew, when you think about the the investment plan you guys put together, can you talk about the complexity of it and you know the magnitude of it? Maybe some of the results around the BCA and, and how you guys leverage that in the case. Yeah, sure. Uh, so we ultimately proposed a two billion dollar uh, t and d investment plan over a six-year period in indiana uh, we had 17 transmission programs around 18 distribution programs within those programs were hundreds of projects as you can imagine and we needed a uh, way to uh, analyze those projects and uh, provide a uh, benefit cost uh, analysis to the regulator uh, and when we started the uh, developing the plan early on we had over four billion dollars worth of uh, candidate projects that uh, you know were being considered and so we we needed a way to uh, you know for lack of a better phrase grade the projects uh, score them and decipher it down into a uh, portfolio that we all that is what we ultimately presented to the commission and and had a quantified uh, cost uh, benefit cost analysis that uh, was strong and and made sense. Yep, thanks, Andrew. Um, and we wanted to know here also uh, during this process, um, you know, even though the benefit cost analysis may not turn out, uh, you know, to indicate investment. In there may other may be other qualitative uh, benefits that are more difficult to quantify um, that would still make that project viable. Um, right. And, you know, if we think about like 4KV systems, right. um, you know, sometimes that doesn't work out as well. But there are compelling reasons to go ahead and convert that 4KV system. And I think Andrew, you made that that case that point in one of the cases here. Right. Yeah. We we had. Uh... A, a project in particular that you alluded to in our portfolio, Jim, that uh, uh, was a con converting our 4K KV system uh, in Indiana. And uh, just to do the nature of our service territory, uh, there it didn't score particularly high on the benefit cost ratio. Uh, but 
it obviously made sense to to um, convert the the system or upgrade the system. Uh, we we didn't want to leave uh, rural areas of the service territory or small pockets of customers with an antiquated system. So you know that was incumbent upon us to tell the story to the regulator. Um, but I think it also added a uh, a little bit of authenticity to the benefit cost analysis that we uh, put forward and the process that we went through with Black and Beach and Copperleaf. Uh, you know, it added that authenticity to the commission to say, hey, look, you know, we know this project makes sense. We think you believe this project would make sense regardless of how it scores, but we're showing you this does not meet the, the uh, that it is underwater and that um, just lends credence to all of our other projects that came through with much higher uh, BCR scores. Yep, great point. So when we look at the, you know, the process but about putting um, investment plans together, we kind of look at it in this way, and that is really providing or developing a process and being able to provide line of sight um, all the way from the cost benefit uh, methodologies and how that is done, um, aggregated into an investment plan, right? Um, and then the utility looks at it and they develop and present and align all those aligned objectives. And then it's submitted to the regulator for approval um, and their review. So um, what we're trying to do here <clears throat> from a large perspective is, is to be transparent and to create clear line of sight from objectives all the way down to the, the costing and, the, and how we derive benefits uh, from each one of those programs. So sort of at a high level, the process we go through here is um, when we work with clients is um, we want to first of all get the investment plan objectives in alignment, right? And utilities have investment plans already, and so we we bring those in under the existing investment program. And then when we talk about these new objectives and how we bring solutions to those new objectives, those have to be identified and defined. And then we've got this candidate list of programs. Um, and then we do a little bit of analysis to say, just a high level analysis to say, you know, which ones should we really focus on here and um, start developing a little more detail around. And that's the finalized list of programs and their scope. And then the second part of our process here is really the plan development. And at a high level, what we do is we take those programs and we start identifying all the potential benefits. And then we start mapping those benefits to all of those programs. Uh, like I indicated earlier on when we talked about clean energy and how we can derive benefits um, from a self-healing network back to clean energy. And it's that tie through that benefit mapping that allows us to derive those benefits for those programs. And so once that's done is really when a lot of the hard work begins, right? You've got to find, um, we turn to our planning and operations folks to do this, but we have to identify candidate projects across all of those different programs. And then and Andrew alluded to this, this was literally hundreds of projects, um, maybe close to a thousand projects in, into the multi-billion dollar estimate range, right? And um, so those all become candidate projects that compete for funding um, in the benefit cost analysis um, capability and the optimization capability within the Copper League tool. And so um, really there's two components to this. Um, you know, these are planning and operations projects um, but when we think about investment planning and um, asset management, there will always be aging infrastructure on our system. You know, we add assets to the system and they, they, you know, the utility tries to extract as much life out of those assets. And so there's a component here called asset risk analysis, and it takes all the, the asset register of all the assets on the system, and we do a risk analysis, and then we we were able to take that risk and turn that uh, risk reduction in, into, into dollars, right? And so that's the second component here. Um, and then once we get that built, once we get that data uh, set built, um, we do that BCA analysis. And what we look at is we're, we're able to take um, at a program level and a project level and do a BCA analysis on it. And then what we learn sometimes along the way is that some programs don't make sense. Um, so those programs are removed from consideration. 
Uh, the other piece we want to note here is, um, you know, the rigor around the cost estimates. Um, you know, the, the benefit cost ratio is essentially a function of those two things. We're, we're deriving benefits, but some emphasis around how those cost estimates are made is important as well. And what we recommend for clients is that we, that we use an AACE cost estimate um, uh, rigor around that. And, you know, closer in time, you probably use a higher cost estimate uh, level. And then later in time, you lose a, use a lower cost estimate level. Because in the end, this is an iterative process that you can update on an annual basis. Um, so at that point, it really goes into the, the program project optimization. And then the final plan is developed. And then we start working with the regulatory teams. At, at this stage, the utilities regulatory um, team and their legal teams, while being involved all the way along the plan process here, um, they start giving direction um, to the plan development team on how the data will be presented, how the evidence will be shown, and, and who, who will be witnesses and, and what their topics are going to be. So um, one last um, slide here. What we're trying to emphasize here is that there's an increased um, expectation around this benefit cost analysis. And this partnership we've created with Copperleaf, uh, I think we can extract and, and get to a best practice um, around that. So legacy-wise, um, you know, not a whole lot of um, benefit cost analysis, a lot of risk reduction in there. Um, we have seen and we've worked with clients where um, not all of the programs um, were monetized for benefits, only portions of it were, uh, but the overall benefit of the entire plan uh, was greater than the cost. Um, but what we're emphasizing here is that the best practice in the industry would be to do the hard work and take the time to develop a benefit framework, value framework around each one of your programs and that you can apply to each one of the projects under that program so that the BCAs can be done at a project level. And from there, we can start talking about how do we optimize that entire investment plan based on constraints and um, which, which objectives are emphasized more than others. And lastly, what we wanna emphasize here is, is that when we put this plan together and we can index um, along with um, geographical areas where investments are being made, and that'll allow us to demonstrate that the ESG principles are being applied in the investment planning process. And David will talk about that a little more here in a minute. At the end of the day, um, everybody has a job to do here, right? And so the commissions are put in place um, to review and approve to make sure that investments that utilities are making are prudent. And they bear the burden of being able to make the determination that the costs are justified by the incremental benefits of the investment plan, right? And so the utility takes the burden on being able to put those investment plans together derive those benefits, demonstrate those benefits, and um, present that to the regulator um, to make sure that they have all the evidence they need to make this determination. And at the end of the day, um, you know, this is the process we go through. Uh, the complications are is that there's a lot more objectives, which derives a lot more solutions, and the magnitude and the complexity of doing that is, um, is um, we were enabled to do that through the copper leaf tool and, and the work that Black and Beach does in, in deriving those benefits. So at a, just real briefly here, what we do is we concentrate on those objectives, right? We say, let's start there and let's work our way back to defining the programs. Let's work our way the other way, the cost factors and the benefit factors and the value models. And then what we're doing here is we're just creating line of sight across all of those things to be presented in the case. Um, and this is just an example of, of how we tell that story on a storyboard. Uh, it's at a high level view, but we, we actually list out all of those cost factors, all those benefits, and then we define what those value models are. And then that's the beginning of the story. And it gives a high level view of, of how we arrived at each one of those. So um, I'm going to turn it over to David here uh, to dive a little more deeper into how um, the Copper Leaf tool uh, enables us to do that. Thanks, Jim. So within the investment planning process, we see these two groups, um, you know, collaborating together and they can have very different views, even though they work at the same place. So on one side, you have the planning group, the operational teams, and they're your subject matter experts. They have the investment data, the risk assessments, 
you know, the cost reports and, and the nuts and bolts of, of building uh, that plan. On the other side, you have the executive team, and they're focused on strategic objectives and outcomes and organizational KPIs, as well as any regulatory um, considerations that need to be uh, brought in. So the Copper Leaf tool is really a single source of truth for these two teams to collaborate together and build a plan and use the, uh, the value framework composed of value models to ultimately drive the cost benefit analysis that uh, Jim alluded to in the previous slides. So in Copper Leaf, the business case inputs from a planning team are transformed into values through the value models endorsed by the executive team. And this linkage allows the planning team to understand the big picture while giving the executive team the confidence that the business case analysis is indeed aligned with corporate objectives and regulatory requirements. So as I mentioned, the Valley framework uh, is, is really a highly collaborative process that touches every part of an organization. Uh, it requires a clear line of sight mapping of the benefits and risk uh, involved with each investment or program, as Jim outlined earlier. Um, as trusted partners, Black and & Beach and Carpet Leaf help utilities build a value framework that consists of a robust collection of benefit cost analysis models that are personalized for the type of capital investment that's being undertaken. And these models are directly used in capital planning and scenario analysis to demonstrate um, due diligence and rigor uh, to internal and external stakeholders that the proposed capital plan is hitting the right value measures or the right outcomes that um, aligns with corporate objectives and uh, regulatory requirements. Yeah, Andrew, can you talk a little bit about, um, you know, this, this copper leaf tool is a, a tool, right? And, and utilities in general use tools to analyze systems and, and finances and stuff. Um, can you talk a little bit about how you approached the, um, how, how you approached the um, regulator about the use of the tool and it being new and being able to kind of describe it and, and get comfortable with it. Sure. Yeah. Uh, you know, if we take a step back in Indiana, where uh, the commission is required to make a determination under statute that the benefits of a, of a plan proposal outweigh the, the costs. And the question then is, what does the utility put forward to allow the commission to make that determination? So in, in uh, first generation plans about 10 years ago, you know, you're putting it was a lot of aging infrastructure, risk reduction. Um, you know, there was a lot of analysis that went into that, but the story kind of tells itself, right? You know, you're taking decades old equipment off and replacing it with new. And then this, in our second generation plan, uh, there was a uh, emphasis on um, those factors that some of those factors that Jim had uh, shown on an earlier, Jim that you sh showed on an earlier slide and um, so the the benefit cost analysis um, needed to be a, a little more detailed and a little more robust and copper leaf allowed us to uh, present that story um, you know we met with the commission uh, staff uh, well long before filing and uh, you know walked them through uh, what factors we were considering what was driving the plan what the objectives were, uh, the value measures into, you know, and value models framework back to, you know, back a few slides ago when you're talking about that line of sight, you know, we're able to tell that story with the tool um, walking, you know, through those steps. And, uh, you know, we met with uh, interested uh, interveners and did the same thing. And, you know, the nice thing uh, that I, that I appreciated, you know, coming from the, the legal uh, perspective was we were able to, you know, show the, uh, the, the process and, the, and the, the value measures, those metrics, those, you know, that, that granular data uh, to the extent, you know, those things were being asked, we were able to, you know, tell the story. This is, you know, this project gets quantified this way. This project is being quantified that way. Um, and so, that um, allowed us to really, you know, tell that story with the with the regulator and the uh, interveners. Yeah, thanks, uh, Jason. I know you guys are early on in in the process here, but can you speak to maybe some of the challenges associated with, um, you know, getting in this position? This is a lot of work to get here. Um, 
but just it, um, maybe some of the challenges. Yeah, certainly. So the you know one of the the first challenges is is getting sitting down with. I guess my role in TNM is is turning all these you know regulations and visions and whatnot into tangible actions and, and investment plans, but certainly um, getting internal agreement on on how to value something, uh, what types of projects are valued, how they're valued, and and, and um, you know, we're a hundred-year-old utility. Uh, we're, we're vertically integrated. We have separate uh, generation, transmission, distribution departments, and and certainly the back a few slides. You're showing the new options of technologies that, and several of those bleed over to different departments. So even getting, kind of breaking down the internal silos and getting the di different departments together to talk about a single project to agree on what it's worth to the consumer or to the customer. Uh, our ultimate goal is to bring the most value to the customer. And uh, it, it's, you know, kind of working through that process to, to ensure that that happens. Is, uh, it's not an easy undertaking. You, you characterize that correctly. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, David, thanks for letting us interject there. But um, uh, what really makes us, um, enabled is, is the tool, but there's a lot of work behind that. So uh, you done on this slide, David? Yes, I'm good for this one. Yeah, so this next slide is just an example of a value framework. And you can see a list of different models that's been brought into this framework to um, serve a uh, specific purpose as Jim and uh, Andrew and, uh, and Jason alluded to really looking at the type of programs and investments that you're trying to value and uh, working collaboratively with the different teams internally and externally to get to that consensus of what should be the value um, outcomes of a given project or capital investment. So um, depending on the type of project, you may select um, a particular type of model. In this case, we have an example here shown just to illustrate how, uh, you know, different value frameworks can achieve um, and, and accomplish different things. It comes down to the models that you build within um, the tool um, and it's really personalized and bespoke to the utility's unique um, operating environment, um, regulatory jurisdictions, and the assets that uh, they're trying to, to optimize. So Next slide, I and this is the uh, uh, one of the last slide for me. So just to highlight the three key components of the copper leaf tool from a business case standpoint is looking at risk, benefits, and costs. So risk captures the value in avoiding undesirable outcomes. Uh, the benefits capture the value of desirable outcomes, such as cost savings, for for example. And the cost is the dollar spent um, to construct or uh, complete a project. So in this example, we can see that this particular program assessment um, has value measures um, across these three different categories. There's risk reduction that is being achieved by this investment. There's financial and environmental benefits as well. And of course, there's the underlying cost of actually doing the work. And this allows um, utilities to have a, essentially a scorecard, a snapshot of what the business case is for a given program and how it can dynamically change if you're taking out assets, if you're increasing or decreasing scope, or you're deferring um, the work uh, uh, or accelerating the work, depending on what kind of constraints that you have. And uh, the last slide, uh, slide I have is just to touch a little bit on the ESG uh, kind of mega trend that we're seeing um, and a lot of the clients that we work with um, across uh, the continent. So. What we are seeing is uh, some of the public utility commissions are, are, are emphasizing more on is to consider the level of risk that's impacting different communities. Um, and that's looking at overlays of um, census tracts, of um, different types of screening tools in order to see uh, what the underlying communities um, look like and what type of risk levels are currently impacting today. So with a tool like Copperleaf, you're able to then see based on your proposed um, program, what the spend levels are across these communities and what the value of the risk mitigation is 
specifically to um, disadvantaged communities versus non-disadvantaged communities and what kind of benefits um, they can expect um, based on the plan that's being put forward. So in Copperly, we're, we're not looking to be prescriptive about how you consider these strategies. It's more identifying how your spend levels currently exist today. And if you're in a jurisdiction where this needs to be considered a little bit more um, acutely, then you can start seeing how different constraints or different funding levels um, are able to divide the resources more proportionally to achieve a fair outcome to all the communities and service areas that the utility um, operates in. Great, thanks, David. Um, Jason, can, um, can you kind of spend a little time talking about how ESG principles are being applied in your jurisdiction? Yeah, so ESG is important to our company as well. And even, um, oh, I guess some recent filings, we just, uh, well, actually, actually pretty much at all of the recent filings, uh, the questions are asked, you know, which, which communities are benefiting the most or which communities are impacted the most. Um, and kind of through, you know, we're kind of early on uh, figuring this out, kind of like with with other utilities, uh, exactly how we're going to how how we're doing this. But we're looking at circle circuit level analysis and, and using Copperly to kind of help answer those questions uh, more easily than than you know, dedicating people to go uh, do studies. Perfect. Um, you know the the benefit of Copper Leaf and building this um, building this database of projects and organizing investment plans in this fashion is first you can demonstrate um, where funding is going and secondly um, you can readjust the plan you can re-optimize your plan based on you know circumstances so the flexibility is built in here you got to do the hard work at the, at the beginning and on the groundwork but it, it enables um, you know that story to be told. So, um, like I mentioned earlier, once we get through this process, we're at the final plan. We kind of turn this over to the to the utilities regulator te uh, regulator teams and their legal teams, and, um, and then they start putting together, you know, what's going to be presented, how it's going to be presented. But um, what we want to emphasize here is, is, if you go through this hard work and you build these value models and you socialize it, and everybody's on board, uh, regulatory filings become less um, dramatic. Uh, you know, less hard to do, I guess, um, in the sense that um, you, you're just doing business this way, right? Um, and so um, it, it takes a long while to get there, but um, Andrew's smiling because, um, you know, it is a painstaking process to go through. But if you build your business processes around this, that eases the pain around there. Um, so we wanted to conclude here, really, I'm not sure we're right on time. Um, wanted to conclude here and just really run through a list of um, what what the capabilities of a investment plan should entail right and it's it's kind of a summary of what we've gone through here but you know when we think about aligning the regulatory and utility objectives together that's that's front end work um, it it makes sure everybody's going and selling in the right direction and then the investment plan is aligned with the objectives Right, that's the plan development part. That's aligning or mapping your benefits to each one of the objectives. Um, and then, what we're emphasizing here is is that if you can get a benefit cost analysis done at the project level, it allows so many more um, demonstrations on the, the rigor around the plan, how you optimize the plan, and all the stories you can tell around that. Uh, the other thing we think. You know, should be demonstrable in an investment plan is that a host or a, a large um, candidate project pool was created where um, those dollars that funding was uh, actually competed for now i've got on here non-discretionary projects um, you know some of these are we refer to them as must do's um, but there's no reason why we can't add you know identify the value to those non-discretionary projects and identify that in the investment plan. For example, um, uh, ground line treatment of poles and, and replacement of poles. Um, the utility's been doing that for years, a very long time. Um, they're gonna continue to do that because it's the right thing to do. We would consider that non-discretionary. 
but we can still derive the value out of doing that. Again, you know, how was the plan optimized? Um, why were the constraints applied the way they were? Um, and, you know, if we can monetize the value at each one of the projects level, then we can roll that up to the program level and now start talking about benefit cost analysis at a higher level um, in the presentation. And like we just talked about, being able to um, identify and demonstrate funding levels at you know, each one of the unserved, underserved communities and environmental justice areas. And then the last piece here is around cost. Um, we really do think it's important um, to demonstrate that um, enough effort was put into the cost estimates that the variation in those costs over time um, are within the range of what the benefit cost uh, ratio would be. Uh, so um, kind of like the capabilities of a good investment plan here. Um, just want to give one example real quick here on what that means, right? So if we can demonstrate at the end of this process that um, a pool of projects were considered and based on the benefit cost analysis, a smaller pool of projects are being proposed in the investment plan, and if we can take it one step further and say, at the program level and at the project level, we can identify where those benefits are coming from, um, that's a pretty good story to tell. And it allows us also to make adjustments to that as we're working our way through the investment plan, making sure that the investment plan emphasizes those things that, that need to be emphasized. Um, and this is just one illustration of how we can do that. At the end of the day, uh, when everything's said and done, the investment plan is really a balancing act. It's a balancing act between safe, reliable, clean, affordability, and making sure that it's equitable to all the all the stakeholders. So I um, wanted to end on that note um, as far as, uh, as comments go. I think we got some questions that we can field here. Um, Jamin, if you want to run through those and uh, pose them to the panelists. Yeah. Uh Thank you all of you for, for your insights on the process. Uh, it really helps. Uh, there are a few very interesting questions. The first question that uh, that is coming, I think a couple of them aligned with that is, can you consider the non-financial benefits along with the financial benefits to determine the value? And uh, this, this will help in uh, improving the overall uh, BCA. So if you have some insights on that. David, you want to swing at that first? Yeah, sure. So I think one of the very common non-financial benefits that we value is really look at risk mitigation because you're you're avoiding something that may not have occurred, that may not have hit your uh, bottom line yet, but you're making a judgment and a forecast based on your available data, you know, what the value of that risk of mitigating that risk, of avoiding that uh, negative outcome. So we have uh, essentially all these different value measures on a common scale so that financial and non-financial benefits can be um, on an equal playing field, equal have equal weighting, or you can look at weighting certain types of value measures um, higher compared to um, other measures. So um, that's one um, component that I see that non-financial gym um, that, that comes up uh, um, right off the bat. Yeah, that's a good one. Thanks, David. And, um, you know, the concept of monetizing risk reduction is something that, you know, would have to be developed and articulated, um, you know, to stakeholders. Uh, but it is a, is a big part of the investment plan. Any other questions, Jamin? Yes. Uh, the next one that we are getting is, uh, and if there is an increasing challenges for asset valuation uh, in quantifying the value of flexibility in managing integration of renewable generation and specifically how it performs in operations. How are you addressing this in your framework? So the question is around flexibility, integration of renewables, uh, can those be included? Yes. Um, I think value models around that. And I think, you know, it starts back up at the um, identifying those benefits like we discussed earlier. Uh, we rely on our engineering groups and our operations folks to define those programs. 
and then being able to tie all those benefits across all those um, programs back to that objective, right? And I think this what what we're saying here is the objective here is is uh, you know decarbonization. Where is where will the energy resources be, and how does that affect the system that it's on, either the transmission or the distribution system? And what investments do you have to make uh, to accommodate that? And um, to help tell the story on the investment is you got to be able to tie all those desperate um, in benefits across all those programs back together. I don't know if that answers the question, but um, that was my attempt at it. David, you want to take a swing at that one? I think the, the flexibility, the value of flexibility is really something that, again, comes from the engineering team um, and the planning team as they're looking and evaluating the projects, right? So if uh, managing the integration of, of new generation capacity could um, mean that investing in a project today can lead to cost savings into the future. So financial benefits uh, through reduced CapEx spending that we may need to occur down the road if we um, uh, took a different decision today in our plan. So that's one way we could bring that into the framework. Um, again, it really relies on the operational input and um, and having that line of sight on what type of benefits and value there is in increasing flexibility in the system and the grid. And Jason, you're going through that process right now, right? Um, trying to okay. identify those programs. We are, and, and what I would say is it's not easy. You know, it's, there's not necessarily a, in an encyclopedia you can go open and say this is the value of a flexible resource. Uh, because there's a lot of different uh, attributes, you know, of, you know, associated with where it is, how it's used, you know, what's the current state of the system, and so forth. Um, when we when we're looking at evaluating those within Copper Leaf, though, and it, it's a matter of trying to catch capture all those different variables and assign some level of of value to them. And so, as the portfolio changes or or some other, you know, the, the uh, the requirements change where we're able to to adapt with that uh, with those changes but yeah it's we we shut down our one of our coal plants uh, just a couple of years ago um, we're, we're replacing everything with solar and, and batteries and wind and it's I mean, part of the reason that there's webinars like this is because I think there's uh, what we're dealing with is very challenging without easy answers, and that's that's probably not adequate, but uh, that, that's kind of our experience. Thanks. Thanks for that. Uh, we have got next question for David. David, uh, the the map that you showed for uh, ESG. Uh, are you showing that as the official environmental justice communities as defined by federal regulations or uh, is there something else that you are presenting? Yeah, so that example was actually from um, the Cal California environmental screen and uh, the disadvantaged and vulnerable communities overlay. So it's at the state level um, where this map was, was borrowed from. And uh, so I'm not sure if the federal regulations had picked that up, um, to, you know, explicitly, um, but that's certainly what certain states are looking at um, in terms of the census data that's available to them. Mm -hmm. Thanks, David. Uh, the next one that we have is, how do you balance the benefits to current customers versus the cost to the future customers? With aging assets and fast investment patterns, in some cases, the current customers are reaping benefits largely funded many years in the past while loading cost onto future customers in the name of affordability today. Yeah, that is a great question and um, probably more associated with rate making um, in the structure of, of rates. Um, I'm not sure I'm... Uh, I'm not sure I'm qualified to answer that one, Jamin. Well, I, Jim, let me uh, take a crack at that. I don't know if I'm going to answer this question directly because it, it seems, like you said, a little more rate making. But I would say that 
as we were putting together our plan and our proposal, we're looking at uh, obviously like you you showed in your PowerPoint, all of the the benefits, the factors uh, that we're driving from one of those earlier slides that had the five factors on them. You know, a few of those are driving our plan. We're getting metrics and uh, quantifying the benefits. But the plan for us was presented with a benefit cost uh, analysis for the entire plan. And the, and the plan was not focused solely in one area of the service territory. It was across the whole service territory. So the portfolio was a benefit to the entire Duke Energy Indiana grid, which benefits all of our customers and not, not necessarily um, a specific category of customers. And so customers that come, uh, that are currently uh, connected to our grid will reap the benefits and the customers that come in the future will uh, reap the benefits. And I would say the customers that have been here for a long time uh, have benefited from our, uh, excellent performance um, over the past decades. Thanks, Henry. Uh, the next one that we have is, how does the corporate financial strategy interact or influence the asset investment plan? Yeah, um, I'll take that one. So um, there's probably a, a up in the strategy phase, a step that needs to be considered, right? And that is, um, to what extent um, do we want to um, press the envelope on affordability? And and really, that can be determined on the front end, right? And, and the, the magnitude of the investment plan can be settled. And, um, and that's one of the constraints when we put the investment plan together. We really recommend that taking place at the front end um, and through the race department and through your finance departments, you can, you can kind of kind of tweak that in there and, and find out what the funding level um, would be and what the impact on rates would be, you know, over the long haul. Uh, great to know that on the front end so that when we start running the investment plans and, and the optimizations and, and the constraints there, um, we're not, you know, we have some guidance on on what the magnitude is going to be. And, and so maybe indicate this in, in some jurisdictions, we see that that affordability is, is built into the statute. Right. There's, um, you know, go off and get all these objectives completed, submit a plan to us, um, but let it go above this level from a rate impact perspective. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Jim. Uh, the next question that we have is, was this BCA approach implemented proactively or rather due to the regulator's requirement? If proactive, do you anticipate the regulators will at some point require this BCA approach for investment justification? Um, well, I'll give you my opinion, and it's just that an opinion. Um, you know, when you do good work and uh, it's received well, the expectation of doing work going forward has just increased. Yeah. yeah uh, and, uh, and you, and, you might be able to talk to that. Andrew, you might be able to talk that a little bit around, um, you know, uh, first phase, second phase, expectations right. growing over time. I would say, you know, as I mentioned earlier, in Indiana, we we the commission is tasked with making a determination that the costs of, or excuse me, the benefits of a proposal outweigh the costs. Now, that doesn't necessarily require the utility to do a certain BCA approach or not, but uh, it obviously seems to be appropriate under that regulatory framework, right? And I would say, Jim mentioned a minute ago that, you know, if you do this, it makes the regulatory process super easy, which I would beg to differ. But what it does do is it makes it uh, easy to tell the story, right? Because you're able to, uh, you know, really support your projects your portfolio portfolio in a robust way with this bca approach and so um the the regulatory process in and of itself is just as hard as it's always been but it really gave us a uh a comfort level on uh the support we had behind our projects to demonstrate that they were very meaningful 
and would lead to benefits to customers uh, on the Duke Energy Indiana system. Yeah, and I'm not um, I'm not in the regulatory department, and, but I'm not aware of um, the same the same statute, New Mexico, that that Andrew was talking about in Indiana. However, our, you know, even recently, our our regulate regulators have been asking for cost benefit analysis for different types of investments. However, I would offer internally just balancing, you know, the the are companies not able to to fund everything every year and so just even balancing the internal portfolio and, and list of projects on what brings the most value uh in, is the re is one of the primary reasons that we're going down this path and in bringing more rigor to our our cost benefit analysis if, if that makes sense uh, but certainly I can see where uh, Jim says no there's no good work that goes unpunished um, and and I feel in New Mexico that might be a, a true statement as well although I'm not in the re I'll this draw the disclaimer again I'm not in the regulatory department so yeah and if you think about it in that perspective right um, who benefits from that in the end uh, the customers benefit from that right if funding is directed to those programs and projects that derive the most customer benefits and other projects are not done, that just drives efficiency around the process. Um, so I, at the end of the day, customers benefit from going through that process. Sure. Uh, we are last uh, couple of minutes if uh, Jim, uh, you want to do the closing remarks. Um, sure. Thanks, Jamin. Thanks for fielding those questions and sorting through them for us. But uh, first, I'd like to thank um, Andrew and Jason um, for joining us here today. Um, we have uh, journeyed through uh, this process with these guys. We're, we're starting that process here with, with Jason and team. I also want to thank David uh, for joining us and bringing the insight around the details associated with uh, value frameworks, value models, value measures and things. Um, it's a great partnership. Uh, we think we complement each other uh, in the sense that uh, you know, BV brings the industry expertise to it. Uh, Copperleaf brings uh, a robust enterprise-wide um, platform to do this work across all facets of the business. Um, and David touched on this calibration across you know different business issues and, and consequences. Um, that that becomes pretty powerful in in the end. And it also, um, no matter what business you're in, either utility business or outside the utility business, it allows um, decision making on investments to be data driven and it allows uh, those investments to be aligned with the objectives of the company. So um, we think that's a really strong uh, partnership and a strong way to do business. And um, uh, just want to thank everybody for joining us and uh, hopefully we can get to talk to more. So with that, <laughs> I, that's all we have. Thanks, Jim, and thanks, panel. And attendees, thank you for participating today. As you log off, please take a moment to complete our survey and give us your feedback. Thank you so much for attending. This concludes today's presentation.